quantum computing is getting quite a lot of coverage these days in the media, which I think is fantastic. But when I read some of the things, there are a few things that are a bit wrong. And I'm not really criticizing anyone. Quantum computing is very hard. <laughs> but I think there's some room for some more nuance. So here are my top five clarifications about quantum computing. A standard description of quantum computing normally goes something like this. Quantum computers are made of qubits, which can be in a state of zero and one at the same time. All of the qubits are then entangled so that they're all treated as a single object that's in many different states at the same time. Therefore, a quantum computer is like an infinitely parallel computer. Now, that's not quite right. So it's true that quantum computers are in multiple states at the same time before you measure them, but as soon as you measure them, you only get one state back. Parallel computing deals with breaking down large problems into small chunks which can each be solved on a processor before the whole thing's recombined. But the architecture is very different to quantum computers. In a parallel computer you've got many different independent processes running at the same time rather than an entangled state. And also you can read out any of the states of any of the processes at any time you like. Number two. Imagine this situation, you've got someone who says they've developed a quantum algorithm that needs 100 qubits in order to run. And you've got another person who says, I've built this quantum computer and it's got 100 qubits in it. So any normal person would say, okay, great, you can just take that algorithm and put it on that machine and get an answer. But in most cases, that's really not true. And it's because they're talking about two different kinds of qubits. In the algorithm sense, what they're talking about is an theoretical ideal qubit, which is commonly referred to as a logical qubit. Whereas in a quantum computer sense, they're talking about a real physical device, which could be like a loop of metal, an atom, an electron, a photon, something like that. And these physical qubits have noise in them because they, they're real devices living in the real world and noise is a killer for quantum algorithms. It will destroy your quantum state. So people are all trying to make qubits with as low noise possible but the quality of your qubit matters a huge amount to how good your quantum computer is. Now theoretically there's a way of getting around noise in qubits using a technique called quantum error correction which is where you use multiple physical qubits to simulate one logical qubit and how many physical qubits you actually need to simulate a logical qubit depends on how good quality those physical qubits are the higher quality they are the fewer you need but estimates range from say 10,000 physical qubits to 100 physical qubits per logical qubit that brings me on to point three, which is quantum computers and internet encryption. So a lot of the internet encryption is based on the fact that it's really hard to factor large numbers on a classical computer. And there's this quantum algorithm called Shor's algorithm that can theoretically factor these large numbers exponentially faster than the best classical algorithm. The trouble is, for a standard 128-bit encryption, you'd need about a thousand qubits for Shor's algorithm to run. And that means that you'd need a million or more physical qubits in order to run it. And that's a really massive number of qubits. Currently, we have the best is 72 qubits that Google has in the universal quantum computing scheme. And so it's going to be a very long time until we hit a million. So, for the time being, your internet secrets are safe. Point number four is the fact that nobody knows for sure that quantum computing will ever work at scale. Some people argue that noise is such a significant issue that it will be impossible to get, say, a, th a million qubits all working together without noise coming along and ruining everything. And it's a fair point. Personally, I'm optimistic. Human ingenuity can go a very long way. Some people said that we would never detect gravitational waves on Earth because noise is a too significant issue for that, and yet the people at LIGO did an absolute incredible job over many years, and now we can detect gravitational waves on Earth, which is an amazing achievement. It's not exactly equivalent to quantum computing, but you know the only way we can find out whether we can do it is by trying to do it and 
like I say, I am optimistic. But it's always worth bearing in mind that it's not guaranteed. And the final point I want to make is about quantum supremacy. Now, I think quantum supremacy is a bad name because it poorly describes the thing that it's trying to describe. Now, I've done a whole video on quantum supremacy, so check that out if you want to find more details about it. But basically, it's the moment in time where a quantum computer can do one thing better than the best classical supercomputers can do. Now, currently, classical computers can do everything a quantum computer can do and more. But if you think about it, quantum supremacy makes it sound like it's the time when a quantum computer can do everything a classical computer can do and more. But that's really not what it is. It's the time when a quantum computer can do one tiny little thing better than a classical computer. So it shouldn't really be called quantum supremacy. It should be called something more like a quantum glimmer of hope or a lot of people are calling it a quantum advantage which I think is probably a better name. Well I hope that cleared up a few things, gave you a bit more subtlety into what quantum computers can and can't do. Personally I'm really excited about where quantum computers are going to go in the future. I think the potential applications of it are massive, especially in the realm of quantum simulation because that's something that we really struggle to do on classical computers because quantum, quantum systems are so hard to simulate. A quantum computer can do it a lot better theoretically and that could be revolutionary in say like simulating materials to find out what properties different materials have with strength durability or exotic things like high temperature superconductors. Um, also in chemistry if you could simulate how molecules interact, say a molecule in a drug, how that interacts with many different biomolecules in your body, that would be a, an amazing thing to do and something we can't do right now. So I'm very excited to see what happens in the future and I'll keep you updated here. Thanks again to the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. What they've done is taken proper maths and science and put it in this framework where it pretty much feels like you're solving puzzles, but you're solving real problems from maths and science and learning real STEM skills. And when I'm looking for a brain teaser, I like doing their problems of the week. And the problems range from being very approachable through to some stuff that is legitimately difficult. Uh, they also have courses on physics, mathematics, computer science, and they're adding more content all the time. And the thing I love is when you're doing a hard problem and you finally see how to solve it, you crack the problem and you get it right. And you have a moment of feeling like, yes, <laughs> I'm not a complete idiot. Uh, and that's what I enjoy. So if that sounds interesting, go to brilliant.org slash DOS. And I've also put a link in the description below. Thanks for watching my video and I will see you on the next one.